hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 247, Pearl Harbor, American Perspective, part two. Picking up from episode 239, as Admiral Husband Kimmel, Commander-in-Chief of the United States Fleet, as well as the U.S. Pacific Fleet, was getting dressed to head into the office per a phone call about a sub being sunk outside the harbor, a second call came in. This one informed him that Japanese planes were attacking the fleet in Battleship Row and various locations of Ford Island. Kimmel ran out of his house, still doing up his buttons. Going on to his neighbor's yard, which belonged to his chief of staff, Captain John Earle, he joined the captain's wife. Later, Mrs. Earle said that the admiral's face was as white as the uniform he wore. What brought this draining of blood was not only the plethora of enemy planes in the sky, but his witnessing of the Oklahoma lifting out of the water in reaction to a massive explosion and then sinking back down, much lower than it had been before. Another casualty of this surprise air attack that wasn't supposed to happen. When Kimmel reached his base, he ordered the following to be radioed to the entire Pacific Fleet and to Chief of Naval Operations Harold R. Stark. Hostilities with Japan commenced with air raid on Pearl Harbor. He then ordered Patrol Wing 2 to locate enemy force. As for what happened next, Kimmel can be forgiven for being human. Watching the destruction of so much U.S. war materiel under his care, Kimmel knew this was the end of his command. In reaction, he lifted up and crossed his arms over his chest, which allowed him to grab the four-star shoulder boards that indicated his title as Commander-in-Chief Pacific Fleet. In one swift movement, he tore them off. Then, going into another office, he returned, wearing a two-star Rear Admiral shoulder boards. He correctly anticipated his removal from his current position and lowering of rank. As for what happened next to Kimmel, that was simply fate. As Japanese planes were all around, shooting up anything that seemed valuable, the buildings were also targeted. As such, one bullet but who knows from where or what weapon crashed through a nearby window. As it was probably a ricochet, much of its force had been expended, so when it hit Kimmel in the chest, it only stained his white jacket and then bounced off. Kimmel is said to have picked it up and said, I wish it had killed me. As for Battleship Row, as previously covered, it was nothing less than total chaos. At 7.56 a.m., Ensign Roland Brooks, aboard the West Virginia, located on the outer line, second from the left, next to the Oklahoma that was on the left end, thought he saw an explosion aboard the USS California, which was further to the left, or west, ready for inspection. Actually, the fire and smoke Brooks saw was from the western end of Ford Island. As things lined up, the explosion was behind the California. Either way, Brooks activated the alarm for away fire and rescue party. The men below decks on the West Virginia ran to the top, as this called for the men to be ready to assist in an accident, afloat or ashore, away from the ship. Though Brooks got it wrong, the alarm saved many lives by bringing them up from below as the torpedo planes from the Hear You were starting their attack. Aboard the West Virginia, the low-flying planes meant nothing to the sailors, as they had seen countless exercises, which is why men like Marine Bugler Richard Fisk and some of his friends did not go to their battle stations right away. They wanted to see the pilots drop their fake torpedoes. For this, some of the men were saved, some were lost. The West Virginia had 1,541 men on board that morning. 130 
would lose their lives, while 52 more were wounded. It all came down to luck. As for the USS Oklahoma on the left end of the outer line, as she had a system of watertight bulkheads and 13 inches of steel, this city of the sea was considered impervious to attacks and unsinkable by her officers. As the torpedo planes came at the Oklahoma, a fighter flew in seconds before to strafe the decks. Quartermaster Herbert Kennedy watched as a man, probably not yet 20 years old, get hit by rounds from the fighter. Kennedy later reported, The boy that was directly across from me, it just tore him in half. Blood spattered all over me. Senior Reserve Ensign Herb Rommel was on his way to his battle station, but stopped when he saw a PA, or public announcement mic. To increase the chances of his shipmates surviving, he grabbed it and said, Man your battle stations. This is no shit. For all the men aboard the Oklahoma that heard that message through the noise, they knew then this was not a drill or a mistake. No one ever cursed over the PA system. Not that the senior ensign's announcement would make any difference. As for the anti-aircraft batteries, the ready ammunition was locked away. There was no compressed air for the rammers. Hence, the ammo would have to be hand-placed into the breaches. This would slow the use of the weapon. But it was the other missing parts that kept the anti-air guns silent regardless. Not one of them fired off a shot before the Oklahoma rolled over. As her list increased, the lines that held her to the Maryland beside the Oklahoma, but a part of the inner line, began to pop, one by one. Still on board the doomed vessel were 461 men, trapped in the now upside-down Oklahoma. Those who could kept climbing to stay above the rising water. Some got out, many did not like in the brig. That was in the carpenter shop, but as the destruction from one of the torpedoes had pushed debris up against the guard, which pinned him to the wall, he was unable to unlock the jail. All the men inside drowned. As for those that escaped, they either swam for the Maryland or for Fort Island, but some, after exhausting themselves in saving others, ran out of energy and could not complete their last journey. The 461 men still trapped aboard the Oklahoma were reached, but not until the next day, December 8th. But by then, many had died from asphyxiation. 32 men were brought out alive. 429 were not. Hey everyone, Ray here. Have you heard the expression... Less is more. That's so true in our overstimulated world. Or as the folks who make the Ridge Wallet say, cluttered life, cluttered mind. Well, the first step to getting decluttered is taking a look at your wallet. That leather bifold thing bulging out of your pocket. It's more like a suitcase. Old receipts, spent gift cards. No, you need, you want the Ridge Wallet. A minimalist front pocket wallet that will be the last wallet you'll ever buy. The Ridge helps you carry less, but always what you need. It looks nothing like a traditional wallet. Two metal plates of titanium, carbon fiber, or aluminum. So there's an option for everyone. Bound together by a durable elastic band. It's slim FRID blocking and lifetime guaranteed and comes in a dozen different styles and colors. I have the titanium gunmetal and the carbon fiber wallets, so I can switch it up whenever I want. Now I carry what I need in my front pocket, and the Ridge wallet is so slim it seems to disappear, but all my valuables are right there. It's a game changer. And for the ladies, again, you can have all your necessities in one small, sleek, container. 
So join the more than 250,000 men and women who have switched to Ridge Wallet and decluttered their lives. Best of all, get 10% off today with free worldwide shipping by going to ridgewallet.com slash ww2. That's the number two. That's ridgewallet.com slash ww2. And use code ww2. Back in Washington at 1.30 p.m., Navy Secretary Frank Knox's office received the message from Honolulu. Air Raid, Pearl Harbor. This is no drill. The Secretary called the White House right away and reached Harry Hopkins, the President's assistant. Neither man could believe the message, but when it was put before the President, FDR was more open to a Japanese maneuver like this. Still, shock and anger dominated his initial reaction, and he yelled, No! and leaned forward with his torso, like a boxer moving in to strike. FDR was shocked, but not in the same way as Knox or Hopkins. He believed that Japan would do something audacious to escape the trap the United States had put them in, but to attack the United States directly to bring the U.S. into the war against the empire made no sense. The Japanese were having a hard enough time trying to cower China. Now they were going to deal with the might of the U.S. Navy? Why not hit French Indochina, Thailand, or even the USSR for more resources? Countries that were more unlikely to be able to fully respond to an attack. But the U.S.? It made no sense to the President. Still, what was done was done. But at least this meant no more anxiety about what the Japanese would do. No more waiting for a call that told of U.S. casualties. That call was here, now. And now, and for the foreseeable future, the United States' path was clear to bring the Japanese Empire to its knees. As we have seen, once FDR took in the news of the attack, he told Secretary of State Cordell Hull to act as if all was normal when he met with the ambassadors Nomura and Kurusu. Let them be the ones to first talk of war. However, the two Japanese representatives did not know of the attack or that it had been going on for one hour by the time they arrived at Hull's office at 2.05 p.m. They were supposed to be there at 1 o'clock and deliver the 14-point message from Tokyo. But as they had decided to clean it up, they arrived after the attack began and knew nothing about it. But calm would not be a word one used to describe Cordell Hall. As we have seen, he lit into the two ambassadors who, shocked by his seemingly unexplainable temper, left the office after being told off. Not until they were back at their embassy were they informed that not only was their country at war, but the two men had been used by the military to deliver a supposed killing blow. Of course, the delay was the fault of the two diplomats, not that a 30-minute warning, which Tokyo wanted to give, would have been much to go on. The First Lady later noted that FDR, once he absorbed the news, was ready to get on with leading his country, now at war. To her, in some ways, he seemed relieved, as in the worst thing that could happen, had happened. And now it was all about the work much like when he wanted the truth from his doctors about his polio. Tell him the worst so he could digest it and then live with it. But there was a world outside of Pearl Harbor. Right before 3 p.m. Washington time, General George Marshall sent a cable to General Douglas MacArthur in Manila. Hostilities between Japan and the U.S. have commenced carry out tasks assigned in Rainbow Five. But, as we will see, in a sequence of events that 
still remains a mystery. MacArthur's chief of staff, General Richard Sutherland, would not only not allow anyone to see MacArthur, but told the commanding officer's air commander, General Louis Brereton, Formosa, modern Taiwan, was not to be bombed, per the plan of Rainbow Five, but that MacArthur wanted to wait for the Japanese to make the first overt act. To Brereton, that was exactly what Pearl Harbor was. As for the battleship, the 31,400-ton USS Arizona, stationed third from left and on the inside row, she had not suffered greatly from the dive bombers. If anything, the repair ship Vestal, tied to Arizona along the outer row, was acting like a shield. Still, its first torpedo hit came at 7.55 a.m., right after general quarters were sounded. But like throughout Pearl Harbor that day, as for the men that ran up to the crow's nest to fire back, they had no bullets. The man with the key, for whatever reason, never showed up. So Vernon Olson, at least 200 feet above the Arizona's deck, just watched the enemy planes fly in between the masts and attack his ship. With the torpedo bombers having made their run, along with the strafing fighters, it was time for Fuchida's high-level bombers to go in. Hence, he told his radio man to give the su 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 signal. One pilot let go of his 1,763-pound bomb, yet it missed all the vessels below. Enraged, Fuchida shook his fist at the man, who then got on the radio and defended himself by saying anti-aircraft fire had caused him to release too early. Yet considering the state of the Americans' defenses on the ground, Fuchida can be forgiven for thinking this man was lying. As some of the level bombers including Fuchida, were going around for their second and final pass, a massive explosion that would be remembered by everyone on both sides who survived that day came from somewhere along Battleship Row. A mechanic on a nearby tanker said, a spurt of flame came out of the guns in Arizona's number 2 turret, followed by a tremendous explosion of the forward magazine. What followed was a column of dark smoke that rose up to 1,000 meters. What caused the flame and resulting explosion was another 1,763-pound bomb dropped by Tadashi Kasumi from the carrier Huyu. In that moment, more than 1,000 American military personnel were killed. A massive fireball rose up above the Arizona. The ship lifted out of the water, then came down hard. Her body ruptured, her back broken. Some of the men of the Arizona that were not killed instantly were now on fire. Their instincts told them to dive over the side, into the water. But what they found upon hitting the surface was oil, some of it already aflame and other parts not so, until these men landed, igniting that section of the harbor. As the Arizona was soon to be making its way back to California for Christmas, her fuel tanks were full. She had 308 14-inch shells on board, 350 5-inch rounds, and over 100,000 rounds of bullets. In fact, the USS Tennessee, just to the left of the Arizona, also along the inside row, was more damaged from the debris of the Arizona than two direct hits from enemy bombers. The Arizona sank in nine minutes. With her went 1,177 military personnel. Not that it made a difference to those just lost, but Lieutenant Wilmer Gallagher, a dauntless pilot, tried to avenge the Arizona, six months later, when he dropped a bomb on the carrier Akagi. It would be the killing blow of that vessel. 
As he released his payload, Gallagher said softly to himself, Arizona, I remember you. Ironically, as the USS Vestal was a repair ship, it was not under the same restrictions as the battleships in terms of its ammunition that were mostly locked up due to Kimmel's worry about sabotage. Hence, at 7.55 a.m., when her crew went to general quarters, they were able to man their various weapons, the 5-inch, 127mm broadside battery, its 30 caliber Lewis machine guns, and lastly, its 3-inch, 76mm gun. However, after very few rounds were expended, the 3-inch gun jammed. But that was the least of the crew's concerns. The first of two Japanese bombs that landed portside went through three of her decks, then exploded, which started fires that were soon headed towards hundreds of rounds of ammunition. The vessel was just minutes away from the fate of the Arizona, but quick thinking saw that compartment flooded, protecting it from fire. But then came the second bomb, again landing on the port side, but further aft. It exploded after also penetrating several decks. Yet it was the massive explosion from the nearby Arizona that further hampered efforts to save the Vestal. About ten minutes after eight, when Arizona's powder magazine erupted, the blast wave from it cleared the decks of the Vestal. One of those lifted up and over, was its commanding officer, Commander Kaysen Young, yet he swam back to his ship and countermanded the abandoned ship order, yelling, You don't abandon ship on me! Young's first priority was getting the Vestal away from the Arizona. Fortunately, his crew had anticipated this and had begun the process. By 8.45 a.m., the two lines linking the two ships were cut the Vestal began to pull away. But even by then, her rear or stern was sinking, while the Vestal was listing to starboard. Young tried anchoring the Vestal so the crew could work on the many fires on board, but when that clearly wasn't working, he ordered her grounded at 9.50 a.m. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity, and how far would you go to stop someone who was getting in your way. The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil, but it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins versus Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. By 9 a.m., American anti-air defenses were fully engaged. Yet Mitsuo Fuchida, the leader of the Japanese attack, was not impressed. To him, it was another sign that the arrogant Americans had not even bothered to put torpedo crinoline lines or nets around their battleship's water lines. But then, a bang near his aircraft transformed the connecting wire of the stick to his ailerons from a cord to a mere wire. There were already 20 bullet holes in his fuselage, counted by his crew. Then another bang came, and when Fuchida opened his eyes from reflexively closing them, 
a part of his port side, was missing. But his contempt remained, as it had still been a great day for the Empire. As we have seen, the second attack wave added more to the confusion and terror than physical damage. But it had been enough. Logan Ramsey of Patrol Wing 2, who had sent the radio message, This is no drill, contacted his commanding officer, Admiral Bellinger, who was at home, seriously ill. Ramsey got what he needed. Permission was given to send up all and any available naval patrol planes, regardless of danger, to locate the enemy. Or, as Ramsey put it later, get on the operational telephone, call Air Army, and find out where the hell the Japanese planes were coming from. But that was easier said than done. First, very few people were on the other end of phone lines, for various reasons when calls were made. And secondly, few PBYs and other planes had survived the two air attacks. A few planes that did go up, like old Siskorsky JRS-1 planes used for mail delivery, would defend themselves by having a few of the crew carry Springfield rifles to shoot out of the windows. Regardless, they went up, circled the island, but found nothing. Not that it mattered, as their report of nothing reached no one, as, again, the communications of the island were in chaos. But then it seemed that the Americans were about to get on the right track when the Opana radar station on the northern edge of Oahu reported that enemy messages were being picked up to the north of their location. This was just after 10 a.m. But then came another report from the southeast part of the island. Radio signals were also being picked up by them. When that was put together with a report that enemy ships had been spotted to the south of the island, which turned out to be a mistake, float planes from the Minneapolis, a cruiser out on gunnery practice, as well as planes from Halsey's fleet, were sent in that direction. And this confused chase of ghosts only continued. The Dauntlesses that had survived being attacked on their way to Fort Island, were ordered to rearm, refuel, and patrol to the west and southwest of Oahu to catch the Japanese as they were leaving. Soon, these Dauntlesses made contact with destroyers, which was called in, but these turned out to be American destroyers that had survived the attack at Pearl, who had been ordered to sail out of the harbor and head west. The various American machines of war were chasing each other. And with that, the Kido Butai, the first air fleet under Vice Admiral Nagumo, began to sail away from their attack position north of Oahu. Now that the first phase of war between the Empire of Japan and the United States was over, which ended in death and humiliation for the Americans, it was time for the other important part of war. Politics. Admiral William Halsey accused Kimmel's headquarters of leading him around the compass. Rear Admiral Patrick Bellinger would report that he never really knew what the Air Army had on hand or what they did with it before, during, and right after the attack that morning. The Army's Harold Beauty Martin accused the Navy of not putting up an organized search until later in the afternoon of that day. It must be said that none of these accusations were wrong. But it was General Walter Short of the U.S. Army, responsible for the defense of United States military installations in Hawaii, that took the cake in excuses. He reported the fifth column activities added great confusion, as in there were spies and saboteurs all over the island. And he pushed this theory, or excuse, so hard that Secretary of the Navy Knox, who needed an out, would report, the most effective fifth column work in this war was done in Hawaii. As for the real enemy, 
the first air fleet, still 200 miles north of Oahu, the radio silence was maintained as the last of their fighters and bombers landed. 29 planes did not return, but considering the damage done, it was clearly a victory. Commander Fuchida was one of the last to land his plane. He told Genda and Nagumo that four battleships were definitely sunk, and he told of the damage to the other four battleships. When Nagumo asked if the Americans would be able to operate out of Pearl for the next six months, he was told no. This was imperative, as the whole reason for the surprise attack was to protect Operation Number 1, the various attacks about to be launched in Southeast Asia. When the discussion turned to possibly launching a third air attack, Nagumo decided against it. The Americans were fully ready now, and the last thing the Japanese needed was another set of their planes flying back to their carriers that might lead the Americans to them. After all, the American carriers were still out there, somewhere. The order was given. Withdraw. Postscript. I have left out the gruesome details of the attack, and they were all gruesome. When you're dealing with men being incinerated, drowned, asphyxiated, and of course, men covered in oil that catches on fire. But here's one example I could stomach repeating. Arizona seaman First Class Donald Stratton later reported, Both my legs were burnt pretty bad. My legs, arms, face, my hair. Lost a couple of tattoos. I don't recommend that way to get rid of them. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So, we are done with Pearl Harbor now we're going to move on to FDR making a speech, uh, Nimitz being sent out to take command, um, stuff going on with General MacArthur, um, which I'm really fascinated about. I can't wait to get to that, and I will try to be as fair as I possibly can. Um, as you know, for those of you who have studied the Pacific Theater in World War II, the Japanese are going to hit a lot of locations in a, in a very sh uh, condensed amount of time. Um, if any of you could recommend any books um, for some of those campaigns, or at least get me started, uh, I just want to try to deal with it as um, accurately as I can in a chrono chronological order. Um, so if you got any advice or any books or a timeline or, or anything like that would be greatly appreciated. Um, you can always just send me something to the email address, wwiipodcast at gmail.com. So it will not be another two weeks before another episode comes out. I'm going to shoot for Friday, uh, this coming Friday. So we'll just see how it goes. And thank you all for your patience. And as always, take care, everyone.